So this is uh, the third session of our book study on this book. And so if you're in the right place, you're in the right place if you're looking at the writing revolution. And we're doing chapters three and four today. Uh, my name is Mary Newton. I'm the president of Reading League Wisconsin. And we have, I have two more people here that we'll introduce in a minute that are helping to run this meeting. So please keep your mics muted unless you're speaking to the whole group. Um, and re, uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, I'm gonna post that link in the chat box near the end of our meeting today. And please fill out that, you just follow the link and fill out the form today because we'll be sending out all those certificates in one batch tomorrow. Uh, let me see, anything else? I will also post the, um, slides. Let me do that right now. Um, Mary, I can is, take care of that. Okay. If you want. All right. Yep. So we'll put a link to today's um, presentation slides in the um, in the chat box. Okay. If I see Margaret has said she's from Lancaster fifth grade. If other people want to um, just put in the chat box where you're from, what you teach at. So um, that would be great. We kind of get an idea about who's here. All right. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to have our, so we can get started. The, we discovered as we were preparing for today that these chapters have a lot of information packed in them. So we're-, oh, well, we're I don't share quite yet. I got to do my oh, shot. That's right. yeah, don't oh, sure, share quite I'll yet. stop there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if you'd like is, to- This is Jeannie shop. I want Jeannie to uh, introduce herself and, uh, and then she's going to take a screenshot of all of us. Go ahead, yes, Jeannie. my name is Jeannie Shop. I'm a board member of the Wisconsin Reading League. I'm currently serving as a reading specialist, literacy coach, interventionist in Sturgeon Bay Schools. And if you're all ready, I'm going to take a screenshot to show everybody that we're here on a Saturday morning okay. having this wonderful book discussion. Are you ready? Ready? Ready. Go. All right, here we go. Thank you. And uh, Maura Moyle is on, I see her name in our participant list. So Maura is one of our board of directors members. And Maura, can you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Maura. Um, I am a professor at Marquette in speech pathology and audiology. And uh, like Mary said, I am a, a board member of Reading League Wisconsin and I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Maura. And then our um, lead, person for today's discussion is Amy McGovern. And so I'm going to let Amy introduce herself and then get us started. Okay, Amy. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen uh, just a moment here. I am Amy, Amy McGovern. I am also um, in the Reading League Wisconsin, I'm the vice president. And uh, more importantly though, I'm a reading specialist and I work for CISA 9, uh, which is a cooperative education service agency here in Wisconsin. There's 12 of them. See, a lot of you are from, not from our area. Um, and I also will share, it's great to see that there's a big range of grades. I was looking through, um, uh, the chat and we've got kindergarten through 12th grade represented, which is great because the writing revolution really does in fact uh, support so many different grade levels. So um, anyway, I've worn all the hats and I'm excited to, to be here and share uh, and facilitate this really so that we can grow and learn together. So as we said, we are doing chapters three and four today. These are really nice chapters. We've already done our introduction, so I'm just going to keep on going so we can get to the meet. We will meet again, um, just as a reminder, on the 17th, but that one will be in the afternoon. It's a Sunday at 4 p.m., so um, that'll be in the afternoon, and we're doing chapters five and six. Okay. Okay. If you want to use the reactions button, I know you're on Zoom. I know you're all familiar with it. We've all been living Zoom the last couple of years, but it's fun to see your reactions. I can see them. I've got my other screen going where all of your little Brady Bunch faces are. Okay. Uh, there is also a bit.ly for this um, this presentation for our book study, actually. And I'm going to add to it as well 
Jeannie and I both found two different podcasts. Um, she found one from Natalie Wexler on writing, and I found one from Glean, the Glean podcast on handwriting transcription skills. So um, we'll add those to the to this bitly as well. Um, and I'm so happy to see that we have some professors on here as well. I know Maura is our resident professor on our elite, on our board, but it's good to have um, you know, the full range here. That's really wonderful. We can all be learning together. Okay, so chapters three and four are really about um, building that ef effective and efficient paragraph writing. That's the goal. Um, three sort of sets us up and four does the, the heavy lift of the work. So in chapter three, the question is, um, you know, though it's all about why students need to plan before they write. And the question I have for you, and you can either unmute or you can put it into the chat, what kind of writing do we, do we get from students? And this is really regardless of age, right? This spans the spectrum. What kind of writing do we get from kids when we don't ask them to plan? Disorganized, yep. Unorganized, short, mm -hmm. off topic, yep. A single word. Sometimes that's all we get from some kids. Random thoughts. These are all very good. Repetitive, haphazard. Mm -hmm. I like the one long run on sentence. I've seen plenty of those. Short bursts of fragments, yes. Frustrated students, absolutely. Um, and again, that doesn't really matter the age. Uh, they sometimes get very frustrated when we ask them to just write rambling words, great. So this is why you're capturing why it's so important to plan because we want to avoid all of this, right? We really want students to, um, <laughs> Yes, Car uh, Kayla said kinders give you a picture that doesn't relate to their sentence, just what they felt like drawing that day, just in that moment. All right, so William talks about, um, I've mentioned William Van Cleef before, I hope most of you are familiar with him, he uh, passed away a year ago now, uh, expert in writing and dyslexia and um, the English language in general, just a wonderful wealth of knowledge that he carried. And so William talked about the cognitive demand of writing, and he's not alone, many others as well as um, Wexler and Hockman talk about this as well on pages 71 through 73. It's a really, really heavy demand of um, working memory that's placed on us when we are, we are asking kids to write. So if you want to turn to those pages, 71, 73, through 73, you'll see a whole list of things that, um, that we are asking kids to do when they write. And from organizing their thoughts to um, actually having to form the letters to create the words, depending on where they are, those transcription skills, they're a really big deal. And this is one of the big reasons why planning is so important because you alleviate um, you lighten that demand on working memory and executive function when you ask students, when you teach them how to plan for the writing that they're going to do. And that's all what these chapters are about. So the writing rope, this one's from Sedita. We've had this in our other two sessions. Captures, again, when you look at it through the planning lens, all the things that go in into the executive function lens um, you see all the heavy lift that writing is. It's the hardest thing we ask kids to do um, from critical thinking to sentence structure to word choice and actually that transcription skill. And that's not even talking about organization, cause and effect, all those more complex components that come in through good, um, good writing. So the chapters talk about the two most important steps. And if you've read the book, you should be able to identify them. What do you see as the two most important steps? What do Hockman and, and Wexler call out? And you can put, the, yep, okay, into the chat. You can put your answers in the chat. Carol jumped in and said one and three, planning and outlining and revising. And these require a lot of, modeling, I do, we do, you do. So this is kind of a fussy slide here. Um, chapters three and four are all about planning and outlining. Chapter five is about revision. 
So what's skipped in the writing revolution is actually the drafting process, even though, of course, that's what you're doing. You're putting, it's not entirely skipped, it's implied. Um, you're, you're writing it out. Uh, William would say that you want to spend a ton of time just automatizing the planning process. And, and that's across the board. So if we look one of the things he shared was that make a list, right? Just make a linear list of all the things. You pick your topic and you list all the things that the kids know about it. And, and then you have to um, review that. You accept all the responses and you go out together and you cross out the redundancies. So there's a lot of thinking that goes through this. Um, and then from there, you can begin to form your outline. So we're going to go through this process shortly. Uh, I'm curious if you, um, when you think it's OK to stop, um, that's what my, that last question is. So we've got planning, drafting, revising, editing. And what they don't talk about is publishing or the final copy. So we added that in there for your reference. Um, in these chapters, when is it OK, according to Hockman and Wexler, to stop, which one can you stop after? Can you stop after editing? Can you stop after publish? Well, obviously, you stop after publishing, but um, which ones is it okay to stop after? Does that question make sense? No? Oh, you shook your head. So we want to model and practice all of these pieces, right? And we might not take every single piece to fruition. We have to just choose um, where we might stop the process and go on to something else. And they give some very clear guidance about that. Yes, you can stop after the planning and outlining phase and you can stop after the editing phase, but um, it's not okay to stop after the uh, drafting and revising. You wanna, you wanna pull that together. Just one um, one additional word on drafting. <clears throat> we this book really covers drafting if you think about it in chapter two because they talk about going from you know, um, having notes and converting notes into sentences. That's essentially what the drafting process is. By the time you finish your single paragraph outline, you have a topic sentence, a concluding sentence, and you have a bunch of notes for your supporting details. What the drafting process um, involves is taking those notes and converting them into sentences. So they've showed us how to do it in chapter two. Yes, that's right. Okay, Cindy said, I like how they pointed out that the outline helps deepen students' knowledge in the content areas. That is absolutely true. Without um, taking that step, that's why you can stop after it, because really the goal is about understanding um, understanding the, uh, the content better. Okay. I'm sorry if the page numbers don't match. Uh, we'll get that. 71 through 73 is where that information is talked about. Okay. I'll share to a brief story about um, a teacher that I work with in this district where I was the district reading specialist. She was a middle school teacher and she made her SLO, um, her, her individual goal, you know, for the end of the year, um, what she wanted to study, do an action research on, and see that you could see growth on and collect data. She made it all about writing, and, she, and what she wanted to do after she heard William speak was automatize the writing process. So she took a simple prompt from those Ames Web writing prompts that um, they used to have. They're not there anymore, but you can find them on, on Intervention Central. And the open ended, and she would give them, you know, two minutes to plan, three minutes to write, and um, her goal was to see that process transfer into their actual writing. And across the year, it actually did transfer. Um, the students got much better at planning um, because she spent this time and directly made the connection between we're gonna practice this skill here and you're gonna apply it in, your, um, in our actual writing in class. Um, the quality and the quantity of the writing also increased with, uh, as, she, as she worked through the year. So, very interesting um, to see it in play and in action research with a teacher. Okay, what works better? 
paragraph, starting at the paragraph level or at the composition level? Yes. And why would that be? Why is paragraph stronger? Check to see how many folks we have on. 56 today. Okay. Less cognitive load. Mm -hmm. For all those same reasons, right, that we talked about in the executive function part, that would be why starting at the paragraph level, right? If they can't write a paragraph, they can't write a composition. Mm -hmm. I know it's so tempting to go right for the composition because you figure, well, a composition is just a series of paragraphs, right? So we'll cover all the paragraph skills and work on the composition skills at the same time. But it's really, as, as the authors point out, uh, that really turns out to be counterproductive in the long run. It's just better to go step by step and build up to that composition level. Yeah, you want to work from part to whole, right? So um, to jump to the essay level before they've really mastered the paragraph is tends to be a problem for, for most kids. Go slow to go fast. Uh, the high school teachers I worked with were very direct on um, and spending the first, you know, weeks of school really reviewing the paragraph again. Okay, whoops. Mary, could you pop into the chat the um, presenters, the participation slide deck one more time? Yes, I will do that. Hold on just one sec. Okay, yeah, no hurry. Thank you. Okay, so this is, goes back to that other slide. Do students need to take every piece to fruition? Thumbs up, yes. Thumbs down, no. Yeah, we know this is not, and I know that's really difficult, right? How many of you have a hard time with not finishing a piece? Does that feel like, you know, you, you wonder if the kids are going to be upset or if they're, you know, they wonder why you're doing it. Does anyone struggle with that at all? No, Michelle said no, no problems whatsoever. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> Anybody else want to unmute or share on that, that you, you have to struggle with that? Okay. I should just Carrie also said it wasn't hard to, to just move on. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep it going. They're usually more excited to get started than to complete a writing project. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. We usually run out of time. So um, this all is about the, the benefit to just the way the Hockman and Wexler approach this is that so much of it is modeled and you do a lot of shared writing and you want them to do collaborative writing and groups and pair so that by the time you're doing releasing them, they have practiced these skills so frequently with you that they're able to do it on their own. So before they plan a piece of writing, they need to um, do these things. Now this is on page 76. So I know that page number is correct. Uh, we've got to identify the topic, the what, based on what uh, we're learning about. And remember, just as one of, our, one of you said earlier in the chat, this is all about deepening the understanding. So the topic should always be about what you're learning in class. Uh, the who, who is the audience, and that's a weird thing. Um, usually the audience might just be you, but, it, but in some situations, depending on what you teach, it might not be. The audience could be um, the principal. It could be, are you writing to um, a leader in your community? Are you writing to the, a younger grade or an older grade? Who is the audience that's being written to? Um, and then what's the why for this? What's the purpose of the writing? And on pages 77 through 80, they list out the different types of writing. Um, expository would be to explain and inform the narrative, which often can be sequential, but not necessarily. Um, but it does require you know, a clear flow. Organization is important in a narrative. Um, a descriptive piece of writing, which will often include just, you know, including descriptions of using the senses in your writing, and then those opinion or argumentative pieces. So 
um, on page 237, there is a really great list in the appendix of terms that um, the authors feel strongly that, that students really need to wrap their head around. So when we think about academic language, this is a great list of, of academic language. Um, analyze, comment, compare, contrast, criticize, define. These are all tier two words as well. So sometimes we think about vocabulary and the link between um, the tiers of words, tier one every day, tier two, that academic, and then tier three domain specific. These are excellent tier two words. Um, so, and then specifically, they liked emphasizing in this early stage enumerate and justify were two words that were called out. Um, can you justify why you, this fact or this detail? Um, and what's the order in which you're putting them in? Okay, checking the comments here. Okay. Any questions or wonderings on the planning part that we've covered so far? All right, jump in with questions. You can feel free to interrupt. Um, we're gonna go on to chapter four, which is on pages 83 through 110, because this is really where the meat is. We wanted to spend time here, and this is where we're gonna actually do a lot of group participation in this section. So, how to adapt this for those kids who already struggle with working memory. I think, Lara, the best way to think about that is to automatize the process. So it's not so much about adapting the skills, but spending a ton of time on what we're about to do next with the I do, we do. Um, I think that's where the power is in building the cognitive routine about how to approach a piece of writing. William used to say he tutored, he tutored old, older students in writing, at high school and college kids, and they would call him up and like, I have this essay to finish and what do, you know, what do I need to do and can you help me with it? And his first question would be, okay, where's your list? Have you started your list? And then they would say, um, no, <laughs> call me back when you have your list. So that's, that's about the planning process. And so once they had developed their list and had done that, those components, then they were ready to begin organizing and thinking through. So um, I think that's the best way, but if others have other ideas on how we can adapt this, by all means, please share. Okay, so single paragraph outline is what SPO stands for. And um, outline is gonna come through this piece. Remember, we want to take advantage of starting at the paragraph level, but not to forget to do sentence level work. So chapters, the early chapters one and two were all about the sentence composition. And um, Hockman and Wexler and even Van Cleve, we all recommend working at the sentence level throughout. And you know that's where you can do this, the subordinating conjunctions, the positives, you can be building, doing summary sentences, um, which will come up later in a future chapter. Um, but all of that, is necessary. We can't write a good paragraph if we also can't write a good sentence. It all goes together. Okay, so I already talked about this. I do, we do, you do. This is the same idea here, only we're going to be at the single paragraph outline phase. This is what the um, outline looks like. It's on page 247 in your book, and it's also on the resource hub, which is linked. You have to make an account on the Writing Revolution um, web page and then you can get a digital version of this. So we have topic sentence with the filled in line, our shorthand notes with the dotted line and our closing, closing sentence also with a straight line. So to do a single paragraph outline, you've got to be able to identify your topic, purpose and audience, as we said before. And then practice the brainstorming details. And I would suggest that that's making a list. Um, generate a complete topic sentence through that brainstorming. So what is your, you've got your brainstorming idea, you've got your idea, and now we need to develop a topic sentence based on that information. From there, we can categorize the details or select the details that we want to um, pull into our outline. 
that's what BSL stands for, brainstorming list, <laughs> BSL. That was my acronym, not theirs. And then um, in note form, you're going to put those details onto the template. And we talked about the symbols in our previous session. Uh, shorthand is what you're thinking about, the arrows, the slashes, the plus signs to keep these notes short and not to write them in a complete thought because that's going to kind of mess up the whole construction of um, the sentence and the paragraph if you do sentences on your note taking form. And then we want to generate that concluding sentence, which should be similar to, but not exactly the same as your topic sentence. We're going to restate it in a more interesting way that captures those big ideas. So let's actually practice this together. Sorry, that slide didn't get um, <laughs> edited. We're going to talk about summer. That's our topic. And um, there is a jam board that I'm going to throw into the chat. If you have the slide deck open, you can actually um, just click on, on it and the jam board will open for you. This is our group participation section here, ladies and gentlemen. So obviously the summer is going to be a level one, right? This is elementary. Some of you teach middle school, some of you teach high school, some of you are professors. So this process remains the same regardless, but the topic, just to keep it simple for our practice, we chose summer. Okay, so on this, I want you to actually interact here. You're gonna select um, a sticky note and put your ideas in about summer and you can keep them simple. Uh, phrases are ideal. And I just did a little model for you. Um, where I live, it's hot. Um, where you live, it might not be so hot. So uh, again, this is where the post-it note is, sticky note. You can change the color if you want and put your ideas down. So we're gonna, we wanna get at least 15 ideas. Don't actually write on it. Yep, use the post-it notes. And, and don't worry if someone else has already put down what you're thinking of, go ahead and put it down because that will, um, help us know uh, which ideas seem to be the most popular that we might want to write about. Yeah. I'm not really, I'm not categorizing, I'm just moving them. They always land in the same spot <laughs> when people start. I was just in Austin, Texas in June. Human, hot, and sticky describes Austin quite well. Now, if we were doing this as a class, we would be calling on kids and we would be doing this in linear form. I'm using the Jamboard just to model another way to do it and get you all to be able to participate. And you could do a Jamboard with your kids too. Same idea. We got some gardeners in the group. Okay. All right. So we've got one, two, three, four. We've easily got over 15 ideas here, I think. Two. So from here, we want to start thinking about um, a general theme. Do we see a theme emerging? So everyone take a look at these sticky notes and think about what do you see as a theme or a main idea um, among all these notes, it, which is going to translate into what could you use if you write a paragraph about these ideas about summer, what could you use for your topic sentence that will encompass all of these ideas. So think about that. I see Nicholas has fun things to do. Free time outside. Free time, yeah. Okay. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Relaxing outdoor activities. Yep. Seem to be getting some, some themes coming in. Recharging, leisure activities. Good. Okay. So before we do the selecting, categorizing, and sorting, we're going to actually attempt to write a topic sentence on this slide. So you can toggle back and forth. You can look at your inspiration here. And then um, let's have some of you, however many of you that want to, give a go at writing a nice topic sentence for this paragraph about summer. And you can do the same thing with a post-it note. I'm just going to take uh, Jane's idea here. She had a nice topic sentence. So because you all understand what a topic sentence is, we can do it like this, right? Um, in a little while, we'll talk about what happens if kids don't understand what a topic sentence is. Um, summer. What I do in the summer. During the summer, comma, there are many fun activities to enjoy. Summer, comma, with time off and nice weather, comma, offers opportunities not available at other times of the year. So we have a nice range of sentences here, level one sentences and level two sentences. Um, people do many fun things in the summer. That would be a, a good elementary one. Okay. Summer is the best season ever. There's another one, yep. Okay, so from here, we'd want to choose one of these as our, um, I'm just going to add a couple more because you've got some good ones in the chat too. You can see how you need to, your topic sense is going to have to be pretty broad, right? Because you want to encompass as many of those brainstorming ideas as you can. Yep. Okay, one more here. Okay, so go ahead, Mary. And it's, it's interesting, like some of these are, are very broad, um, which is fine. Um, summer is the best season ever. You know, that gives you a lot of leeway to go ahead and talk about the weather, the activities, the, the relaxation, whatever you want. And other people have, have tried to tie in all of, you know, a lot of those um, subordinate details into the topic sentence. So for instance, summer with time off and nice weather offers opportunities not available at other times of the year. Or summer, a hot, humid, relaxing season is a time to have relaxing family fun. So there's like really two ways to go at this. And you know, you could have a very complicated, detailed topic sentence that um, it gives a little preview of the things that you're going to talk about in the sentence, or you could just have um, a very general sentence that doesn't exclude anything um, that you want to include in the paragraph. So Anne-Marie asked a question about any tips to remind students to make the topic sentence broad, not give the details. And I would say the best tip is to make a lot of topic sentences together. So I, you know, you do your brainstorming list and you generate a topic sentence and then you stop, right? Brainstorming list, generate a topic sentence. And you could categorize things then, but it's sort of, it's, it, and then there's also another activity that we'll do later. Uh, we'll show you, because sometimes the problem here is that they don't understand the difference between a topic sentence and supporting details. So we need to set them up with examples of sentences that are supporting details and sentences that are the, 
the main idea of the topic sentence. And there are some resources in the Writing Revolution web um, page that, that actually are set up for you to help do that, to give you examples. And then you can, you know, create your own with, uh, in all of your copious spare time, create your own. I always feel bad when I say that um, because I know you have no time to do any of those things, but um, this is a good time to plan ahead. Okay. Yeah, I right. appreciate what I appreciate what Lisa is saying. You have to, of course, always know who your who your students are, who you're working with. So if you have a group of students whose parents are working all day and they live in an apartment and they're just shut in their apartment and told not to leave, not to go anywhere while their parents are gone. Summer is a, a completely different, a completely different activity for them. Um, yeah. And, you know, so I, I know it in our kids' school, one of the things to always to write about when you came back from to school in the fall was what you did during summer vacation, you know, or, and people wrote about trips and so forth. But then when I was working in a different type of school, well, that would be an inappropriate topic because they didn't do anything different in the summer than they did during the year. So you just always have to be aware of who your students are and you know we chose this topic today not because this is the best topic to give to all elementary classes we chose this topic keeping in mind who was going to be online with us today so the next step after you write your topic sentence is to go back in and start to categorize these lists or the list and look for redundancies. Now, we were already, just because of space, putting down on top of each other things that were the same. Um, in actual class, you would be just listing them, and that will be part of the process of, of eliminating the redundancies. Um, so as we think through, what, what are some of the things, how we can group them? Um, you know, beach, sun, sunsets, those could go together. Zucchini, gardening, visiting family, travel, traveling, there's a redundancy one. Um, cleaning, ooh, not near vacation time. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh no, a big vote for no. <laughs> <laughs> sunscreen, beach. Now you could put insects, could go by gardening. Insects could go by the sun and the beach. Insects could live a lot of places. So fun thing, you can actually duplicate if you wanted to and put insects in more than one spot. Um. I do like, and also you can see as you start grouping, they're sticky, muggy, and humid, which is interesting because, well, Amy and I have also been involved in another, another book study on bringing words to life about vocabulary. And right here, just looking at your brainstorming, you have three different vocabulary words that you can swap out for each other when you're writing about that concept. So, yeah. Here you got um, family that could probably go down there too. Yeah. Family could probably go in more than they one spot. Yeah. Of spots. Mm -hmm. um, and lake, I don't know. I suppose I could go with travel. So, or put that by swimming. Isn't sw yeah, swimming is there? Oh, yeah. Swimming. So, so we have two swimmings. I, we have beach. So that could be another little, yeah. you know, sort of decide where, where do you want those to go? Do yeah. we want beach and lake? And, and we have and, another swimming up at the top that you can move down and group there. Where? Here? Um, down, okay. Way down where the other swimming is. Oh, redundancy. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah, and probably you wouldn't want to have insects by sun and by gardening, right? Because we right. only want to mention insects once. So where do you want the insects to be? What do you think? I think by the gardening, maybe. And so then we'll just delete this one. Yep. Okay. And then we can take sleeping in the pink one and move it over by relaxing and sleep. Mm, yep. Okay. And we have ice cream is in two different places. Where is it in the second? Oh, yes. Okay. So where do we want ice cream to be? I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's so important that it's its own topic. <laughs> <laughs> and we have vacation, visiting family. I mean, these kind of all go together. So yeah, we'll just delete this one. Yeah. Um, we only need one of these. 
So. There was a good comment in the chat about we could have a category of bad things about summer. Ah, yes. Like the sticky, muggy, humid, insects, cleaning, home product, you know, those kind of, summer isn't always, you know, all good. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I'm with you on the cleaning. I do. We all, right. So it's the best yeah. time to do a deep clean in the summer when you have time to think. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Maybe we, so we, maybe we can put that ice cream by the picnics because they both have to do with food. Picnics. Oh, picnics. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sun picnics. Good. Okay. So right, we've got it. And, a, and go so ahead. you could eat, we could also can have your insects in your gardening. I mean, there, you can see now right away now there are different ways you can organize and group. You could take tomatoes and zucchinis and put them with ice cream and picnics. I like, you know, types of food that we might eat in the summer that we don't in other parts, um, in other times of the year. You could take insects and gardenings. You could, you could put those with the cleaning and the home projects. I, you know, there are just a variety of ways that you could go about grouping it. Suppose you could put sticky, muggy, humid all by sun, you know, then they would yeah, all be could. different. It has to do of... with weather, right? Things that yeah, weather related. Mm -hmm. so now we have how many groups? We've got like the weather related comments. We've got the travel comments. We've got the relaxing sleeping comments. We've got the, the work kind of comments, which if you wanted to combine. Um, I think you could put picnics you know? and ice cream together because, yeah. you know, like these, yeah. these feel like all things you would do on a, you know, on a family vacation. And I think the swimming in the lake and the beach, all those things that have to do with water. Um, do, I, I, I'm sure it depends where you live in the summer, but in Wisconsin, I think we a lot of times do think of water. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. And, and I know that when I'm hot and sticky, I really do want to go swimming. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for me, these go together, but maybe they don't for other people, but I'm going to just lump them up because that yeah. one, I'll just eat this one, which is nice. Cause you can do that really easily here. And, um, cause you know, you, you can't write about everything, right. But you want what you do write about to be interesting. So when you can look for these themes, it makes it, we've now taken what was a kind of whole smattering and we're getting one, two, three, four, five ideas, and then we can decide which ones are the most worthy. And would you put relaxing, sleeping in and sleep? with your vacation time or not sometimes sometimes i don't get as much sleep when we travel than when i'm home um right because you're you're the mom doing all the stuff getting everything ready so um i did like the comment in the chat that it's helpful to do to do this kind of thinking out loud um to model for your class so they can see there's no one right way to group all these things but this is sort of the thinking process you go through and you could group them one way and then think, oh, you know what? I think I might might be more interesting to group this way. And Right. So like if you're a person who finds cleaning a way to alleviate stress, then this is a relaxing thing, right? If you like to do home projects, then all of these things could be lumped together. Um, or as somebody else said, maybe you hate cleaning and home projects. And so that would be the things I don't like about summer because I have yeah, to do them. Exactly. So, I mean, I, and I think yeah. you know, often our, our first impulse when we are asked to think about summer, we think about all the great things about summer, but maybe you want to put cleaning and home projects and insects and, you know, put them together. Some people would put gardening under things they don't like about summer. They have to do weeding or whatever. Other people would put it with relaxing. So it's just, you know. Mm -hmm various ways to do this mm -hmm. yeah and you could even relate um you could relate these depending on your again your viewpoint these could be all together um right yeah for some of us cleaning organizing is very satisfying i completely agree right so it really depends on your on your framework um on your own personal and that's where the child's voice would be uh coming through okay Thanks, so, Carol. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Okay, so from here, I'm just going to bounce back. 
So we did the, the topics, um, we've got the brainstorming ideas, we've organized them, we've written our, our topic sentence, and uh, we would then turn these into notes. Um, if the students are not able to write a topic sentence, then there's other things you need to do to support that. Um, okay. So these are, when we talk about process of creating a topic sentence, these are things you might want to address outside of the, um, the process of developing a single paragraph outline. This can be its own activity leading into being able to do a single paragraph outline. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mary, do we wanna go through the um, completion of this task or do we wanna go on to those other slides? We wanna actually... Yeah, look, uh, let's see, let me check on the time. Yeah, it's, um, yeah categorized. Let's, let's, let's take this through and um, see if we can finish it and then we can come back and talk about the specifics about topic sentences. So let's follow this all the way through. So which topic sentence do we wanna go with based on our categorizing? And we're kind of out of order here, but let's just choose one. Uh, let's choose a really broad one. Um, what about this one? Summer is a time for enjoying leisure activities that we don't have time to enjoy during the school year. Well, but it, I don't know. That seems to me during the summer. to be a little specific. I, I like the ones like summer is the best season ever or uh, people do many things fun things in the summer. Well, let's do this one. I know it's, summer I think we could go with that. We could try it. And okay. That way, that way, even the things that you don't like about summer, you can still include in a sentence say, you know, while not everything is great about summer, for instance, mm -hmm. but this is a nice broad topic sentence. Okay. All right, I have to edit the S and add the exclamation point. And then um, which details, as you're thinking about it, which details do we want to include? What are the main themes of each of those? So this is the note-taking component. Um, I've got the Jamboard up here too. So the note-taking component, uh, we've got kind of three to four big themes. Let's uh, do these as let's do these as four themes. So maybe to start with the up the theme that's in the upper right hand corner. Mm -hmm. um, so fun in the sun. Like what's a simple way to say that? Relaxation, family time, travel. Those would be the three big ones. Relaxation, family time, travel. Ellie, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, and they uh, in the template that they give you for single paragraph outline, they have four uh, four areas for notes, but you don't have to have four. You can have three, or you could have five. Four is just you know kind of a common number that we often come up with. Mm -hmm. And there would be a lot more things we could take those ideas and put them into note form adding them on to our single paragraph outline, um, just a couple of details um, to remind the student what they're gonna be turning into a sentence. And then the closing sentence, summer is the best season ever, why? What's the capturing for the closing sentence? Do you wanna put your ideas into the chat? In a closing sentence, you know, you want to echo what you had in your topic sentence, but you don't want to repeat it verbatim. So it's like, you know, it's a little different. Re I like this. I feel recharged and ready for the next school year. <laughs> okay, so we'll just use that one. It's simple. Mm, so many great ways to enjoy the sum. Yeah, that's fine, too.
There are so many great <laughs> ways to enjoy the, this season. The classic. As you can see, there are many different things to love about summer. Yes, that's great. Okay, these are good. I'm going to take this one. You know, and you get these, there are pros and cons to each one of these topic sentences, each, each one of these closing sentences, each one of the lists of groupings of topics, and it's, there's no right or wrong to it. And I, I would be very happy if I were working with a classroom of kids and they came up with any combination of these. They're, they're all workable. These are great. After productive and relaxing summer, we are better able to tackle the new year. Wonderful. Yeah. And that's kind of an example. That and Maura's example are, um, or Maura's concluding sentence, are kind of an example of take not just echoing your topic sentence, but you add a little bit on. So there is that idea that summer is great, but now you've added on that little extra thought. Now I'm recharged for the new year, or I'm, you know ready to tackle the school year. I'm just going to that's add a one and choice. that's one way that you can can take a topic sentence and just add, you know, take it up a little notch by adding something when you put in your uh, closing sentence. Yep. Here's the other one. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to show you some examples from the writing revolution that have these fleshed out. We just wanted to do the process with you. And of course, then the next phase would be to actually construct the paragraph. But with let's keep going a little longer here on um, bounce back here. So we created our topic sentence. Um, there are things you can do with that topic sentence and with the closing sentence, for that matter, where you can get the students to um, Let's say they wrote a very simple one, like, I love all the things I get to do in the summer is pretty simple. Um, you could ask them to change it by adding in a positive or, you know, starting with a subordinating conjunction, which some of you did. Um, you can shoot, make it a declarative. Um, you can tell them the type of sentence you want them to write it or um, modify that simple one to be something different, but with the same idea. Which is kind of what you're doing anyway with the, if you're looking at your topic sentence and you're readjusting it to make it a closing sentence, you have to change it right to make it interesting and keep the reader invested. So there are notes about that on pages 97 through 99. And in the online materials from the writing revolution, <clears throat> teachers have put in a lot of examples of working with kids on here's a topic sentence. Uh, you know, create it in three other sentence types, you know, and, and so there are, are a lot of activities on there involving that, um, uh, involving using different sentence types and using a positives and using subordinating conjunctions. Yeah, there's a good example on page 98 of a, um, of a topic sentence um, about Charlotte's Web and then the closing sentence um, you know, making it, and that same with To Kill a Mockingbird. So there's a level one and a level two example there using in a positive. Um, so those are good examples to, to lean on, to teach from. And same idea, I mean, with giving the kids a topic sentence and then asking them to write a, a different version for the closing sentence, just practicing on those isolated skills and then having them um, really work together in groups first or in pairs to help each other through that is a great strategy. So this is an example from the writing revolution that is about um, a Paralympian. Um, and in this example, of course, the kids would know something about it. They would have read the story. But even if you hadn't read it as adults, you actually can figure out which of these would be um, the topic sentence and which one would be uh, which of the rest are the detail sentences. So as you read through, see if you can figure out which one is the topic sentence. So this is a little different activity that we, we talked about doing some independent activities, working with changing the format of your topic sentence or closing sentence. And this is more about being able to differentiate between the main idea and the subordinating details, right? And some kids do have a lot of trouble doing that. They do. 
So if you just set out a series of sentences that are going to be in your paragraph, which one of these do you think is the topic sentence? After a car accident, she found her love of sports. Yes, although she never thought she would be an athlete, Aileen Roca became a competitive wheelchair racer and skier. However, Roca had a life-changing experience, right? So you can tell the second one is the um, is actually the topic sentence. Because the rest are all details. Go ahead. It, it encompasses all these, the four other details that are on this page, right? Which goes back to the other question that somebody asked, you know, how do you have a topic sentence that doesn't include all the details? Um, this is one that has some of the details, but when you actually look at the full article that this it's quite lengthy and um, they pared it down very simplistically. So, right. So they have competitive wheelchair racer and skier, but it doesn't say that she was a Paralympian, does it? It doesn't put that detail in there. That's in the final uh, sentence here. And although she never thought she would be an athlete, but it doesn't say what was her added, didn't say that she hated sports as a child. That's a separate detail. And, and how did she become, you know, it, although she didn't think she'd be an athlete, she did end up being one. How did that happen? So then that's that whole car accident um, thought. So these all go, these can all be um, used under the uh, overarching um, content of the topic sentence. Yeah, Margaret asked about the articles. They're always included on, um, so I'll just show you a quick example here. Um, here's here is the one on, on uh, Aileen Roca, and that's the what we just did. Here's the article link, and then here's the answer key. So that's the way they're all set up when you, depending on what you're looking for, this particular one. So very and nice. I, I've, I found that the, um, this is kind of a, it's, it's a living website, right? So every time you go on, you'll see new things that have been posted. Some of the older things are taken down, but um, it's, these are the kinds of things that, that kids are reading about in school. I, it's very uh, current and topical, so. Mm hmm. Definitely. Okay. So remember the other things you can do with this besides distinguishing between what's a topic sentence versus supporting details is actually having students change that topic sentence, right? Um, so maybe you don't want them to start with a subordinating conjunction that you just want it to be a more basic sentence, depending on your students. Uh, so this activity is um, asking the students to, again, think about supporting detail versus topic sentence. So here we have two topic sentences about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, and Rosa Parks was an activist long before her moment of disobedience. So here we've got eight sentences at the top, and the students have to um, select which they're not sentences remember they're phrases in note form I should not say that they're phrases in note form and they have to put those phrases in note form down below um, and then eventually then turn them into sentences so wouldn't listen to bus driver arrested which one does that go with she refused to give up her seat on the bus or she was an activist long before her moment of disobedience refused to give up anyone anyone The website is linked to the um, Padlet, so um, which we shared earlier. I can show you the Padlet again. Somebody asked a question, can you? Yes, and that's the answer, refuse to give up her seat. It's over here on the Padlet on the very far right. When you click on it, um, you will need to make, it's the second box right here. You'll need to make a um, account. A free account. Okay, yeah, so she refused to give up her seat, and this is the way they sort them out. Okay, 
so the next thing that you would do with this is then have the students turn those notes into sentences. So that's what I want you to try now is to pick one of those red lines and actually uh, switch it into a sentence because it's difficult to um, take your notes, take the idea, put it into note form, and then take your note form and put it into sentences. Pra let's practice that quick. So if you were going to do Rosa wouldn't, um, number one, wouldn't listen to bus driver arrested, how would we put that into a sentence? Oops, no. Somebody can unmute and say one too. Yes, Rosa refused to listen to the bus driver, which led to her arrest. Since Rosa Parks wouldn't listen to the bus driver, she was arrested. And just, you know, and those are just flipping those two sentences, you know, one starts with, with the, um, the cause she wouldn't listen to the bus driver, so she was arrested. And the other one started with, she was arrested, the result, because the cause, she wouldn't listen to the bus driver. So, you know, you can formulate that sentence either way. This sentence that Ivy put up has more detail in it, which is great. Sharon, you picked the boycott one. Boycott ended, Black people desegregated on the bus. After the boycott ended segregation, the separation of people based on color dropped in the US. That's a great sentence. And think of all the words. One, two, three, four, five. Like 16 words in that sentence. And you and we just took it from these notes, right? From these six um, six words. You got a 16 word sentence. Ivy Rosa refused to obey the bus driver command to give her seat to a white man and was arrested. So that went with. Which one does that go with? Number one. Oh, wouldn't, li wouldn't listen to the bus driver. Thank you. Yes, geez. <laughs> Very good. So you can see when you, if you do an activity like this and you give two different topic sentences and then a group of de uh, supporting details, and then they put the supporting details under the appropriate topic sentence, that's, uh, you know, it's just a way of getting them to say, this sentence belongs here or it doesn't belong here. They're all about Rosa Parks, but they don't all belong in one paragraph, right? You need to separate some things out. Maybe you're only writing a one paragraph um, response to something. You're not even writing more than one. So if your only paragraph is Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, then you're only going to include those details that go with that. You're not going to include the ones about um, how she was, um, you know, whatever, you know, when she, before her moment of, of civil disobedience, you're not going to talk about, about those things, about how she was fighting for voting rights. That, that has to do with the second topic sentence. So you need to be able to um, cross off um, supporting details that don't go with your topic sentence even though they do belong to the overall arching topic. And then if you follow it through and do the taking it from the supporting details notes and creating sentences, supporting sentences, then you get practice doing that conversion also, converting from note to sentence form. So you can do a lot with this activity. Yeah, a lot. So this one is, um, the article link is on Martin Luther King. It comes from the um, 
again from our website. That's the article link. And we've got the topic sentence. Um, we, we were just practicing that, taking the, um, this is all in note form, Martin Luther King, a civil rights leader, fought peacefully to end segregation in America. That's our clean topic sentence. And then we have four notes about what happened to Martin Luther King. And our closing sentence, let's see how it relates to the topic. Although Martin Luther King never saw segregation end, comma, his dream came true and his legacy is honored every third January in the United States. So about Martin Luther King fought peacefully, really a nice concluding sentence, which ties back to all the details that are shared in this very length um, article, this good article about him. It's a great single paragraph outline, exactly mm -hmm. what you want before you start to draft. Let me emphasize that word, before, right? This is what you want to have before you start to produce your draft. And keep in mind, too, that you might be processing this with your students. So um, generating that list of all the things you, you read about with Martin Luther King, um, drafting that topic sentence together. And then in teams, kids could be uh, doing their notes, depending on the age of the students, um, creating the notes. and. Um, assembling the paragraph then on their own based on the note that they developed as a team. So sort of a scaffolded process. You don't, you're, not, you're not assigning kids to do this. You're doing a lot of modeling and leading and then collaborative writing and then independent writing um, so to really support the process. So that goes back to helping. I know what um, the scaffolds that somebody asked about earlier, that's our idea here. A lot of work, but totally worth it in the long run because you're you and your students are not going to have the frustrating experience then of looking at first drafts that are not organized and make no sense so you're going to avoid all of that uh, by following this planning process first yeah there are there do appear to be more level two examples on their website there are some generic ones for level one but when you're getting into the deeper content that feels more like you know middle school intermediate middle school high school um, versus that elementary age but even for the elementary age if you're um you know in the book they tend to just you know use really generic things like they had an example in here about what things that you know about autumn you know, just like we did summer today, but very often, even with single, um, you know, very simple topics like that, that your class, maybe your kindergarten class is studying about farms, and the teacher's doing read-alouds about farms, and the class goes on a field trip to farms, and, you know, different kinds of farms, an animal farm, an apple farm, and if you, um, you know, so they're, they're, they're working on on consolidating their content knowledge too. For us, that all just seems like, well, we know all that, right? It's all background knowledge that that's common to everyone. But to kids in kindergarten, first grade, they're still learning that content. So even though it seems really simple compared to some of these secondary examples, um, it's still the same process of using writing uh, for all ages to improve comprehension. So later in the book, they um, switch the, the task to um, creating the single paragraph outline to then undoing it. Um, so that's sort of the example, not an example. So here we have a paragraph about Mae Jemison and the students need to identify the topic sentence and concluding, underline them and mark them TSCS, and then um, number the detailed sentences. And after they've done that, convert all of that into notes. So again, practicing those steps in, is in isolation, but also based on the content. Remember, we would have been learning about Mae Jemison. So this is a great way to internalize that content by doing this process and using the writing. I just want to let people know that I've just put the link in the chat to request a certificate of attendance for today. So if you do need to do that, the link is right there. It's at currently at the bottom of the chat. And... Um, just be sure to do that today. Yep. So here's um, here's what it looks like. We've got the topic sentence, our three detail sentences, and then the closing sentence. And um, 
the note form. Okay, I do recommend that you practice this more on your own as well, because I think we can't teach what we don't know. So if you can practice creating these and turning these into notes yourselves, that's going to help you be able to teach the kids how to do it. Um, that was our goal here. We're, getting, we're a little short on time, but um, I think for a lot of kids looking at a paragraph that's already been constructed and breaking it down, finding the topic sentence, finding the concluding sentence, finding the, the supporting details is a little, a little less intimidating than, than creating their, sing, their single paragraph outline and then converting it into a paragraph. So Laura asked where you can find the, or Rachel asked where you can find the digital version of the SPO. Once you have your, um, your login for this, you go to, it'll take you to book resources. And if you click on customizable templates, this is where you see um, the digital version of all the things that are in the appendix. So the single paragraph outline is right here. Single And there's also a book report version, which we didn't talk about, very similar transition outline. And later we'll get into the multi-paragraph in, in future sessions. So um, that's where you find it, under book resources, customizable templates. And here's where we pulled all the activities from. This is living, as Mary said. It, it's changed. I mean, I've been looking at this for a year and it has changed a few times since then. Are there questions that you have that we didn't answer today or that there's things you wanted to discuss that we didn't bring up? And here's the full paragraph. We did have a question about that other book study that I mentioned on bringing words to life. We're, we did that as a collaborative book study with um, Collaborative Classroom was the sponsor, and then um, the Reading League Indiana was the main organizer, and then the Reading Leagues from Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania um, have been participating in that. Um, but as far as whether anything is recorded, is it posted anywhere? Um, the best place to find out answers to things like that are to go to um, um, the Reading League Indiana and ask them or go to Collaborative Classroom and ask them. Um, we don't have any recordings of those sessions. Um, they're I, not I, recording those sessions. No. So and their, okay. their book study is all it's okay. about 15 I, minutes of group and then they break into yeah. breakout rooms. I wasn't sure about the the first meeting and the last meeting they had special guests. Isabel Beck is going to be a special guest um, in the final meeting. Perhaps that one might be recorded because it's, you know, it, it lends itself to that format. But really that book study was done in almost entirely breakout sessions. So there's nothing mm -hmm. really to record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so our big takeaways today were really to build that cognitive routine through a lot of practice to reduce the stress on working memory and um, to make those comprehension connections with kids use writing as that format. Uh, don't forget to look at the Padlet and um, and create your, your free access to the Writing Revolutions webpage so you can get all those great goodies. And hopefully we'll see you again on uh, July 17th at four, which is a Sunday. So thank you so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate all your, all your work in putting this together and thank making you. it, organizing it, making it clear to us so mm -hmm. that we have much easier access to the, to the book and the information that's in there. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay, then I think we're about ready to sign off. I'm going to stop recording.